Ja, góðan dagin allir. Velkomin á þannan fyrlustur. Asjör Kúbanetus með honum Robert Strand. Hann mun, þetta verður ekki neinn svona powerpoint slætur. Þetta verður meira svona demo og svona almennt bara yfir um Kúbanetus. Hann vill hafa svona meira fyrirspurnir og þannig að fólk getur spurt bara bynt á hann og hérna fengið svör þannig að hérna hann getur sýnt bara hvað á að gera ef að hérna þið eru í einhverjum vandamálum þannig að endilega skjótið á hann ef að þið hafið spurningar þannig að so Robert welcome to this meeting and thank you for giving us your time uh, for this, we are very happy to have you here. Um, and yeah. uh, so I told told everybody it's like uh, there will be no uh, PowerPoint slides uh, and uh, people are uh, going to give uh, give you some questions uh, on the way. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a couple of things. I'll, um, you know, it's mostly not, you know, it's not a presentation heavy thing. So I'll, I'll I'll kick off with a couple of slides and I'll jump into uh, between that and the portal bit, yeah, between questions. So, you know, if you, uh, just ask whatever you want to ask during this and we'll we'll try to have a more like an open discussion thing, I think is, is best. All right. So, uh, yeah, you go ahead then. I'll give you a touch. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll try to actually get my computer to work. <clears throat> so it's a great start. All right, let's see. All right. <clears throat> I guess you can see this, right? Yep. 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 All right. So <clears throat> first of all, thank you. Uh, just like a really brief introduction to myself. I try to keep this as short as possible. My, my name is Robert and I work for Crayon. Uh, I work for Crayon Group, even though I'm situated in in, in Oslo in in, in Norway. Uh, so I work for the 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 uh, you know the, uh, with the, all the group efforts. So I'm not I'm not working for just one country. I'm working for everyone, every of the countries in in the, in the Crayon uh, Group, um, where I'm trying to do a lot of cloud native things. And and well, obviously I also help a little bit here and there with with customers these days. Even though I try to get out of that because you. Know, I wouldn't want to do that, uh, but I, but uh, but I'm trying to make um, Crayon better at doing things internally, and especially then you know cloud native things. Um, I'm a I'm a Microsoft MVP for Azure, which I uh, uh, you know got my first. This is my first year through with that. Uh, hopefully, it'll be a second year. Um, and also HashiCorp Ambassador for the things that I do with Terraform and automation in general. Um, um, like I said, I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed cloud automator. That's that's kind of what I do. I make clouds work by themselves, so, which is the cool thing. So I also sit in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, in several work groups and uh, technical advisory groups in there and, and do a lot of things with well, Kubernetes and GitOps, for instance. So I, there's some details there, like if you want to go on Twitter or, or GitHub even or, or LinkedIn, just feel free to reach out and all. I'll answer whatever uh, you want to know. Let's see, I don't have my clicker here, uh, so I guess I'll do that automatically. So, first of all, as like a, a just kickoff point, uh, what kind of experiences do the, the you find folks who are in here have with Kubernetes? Are you currently running Kubernetes in production? Are you thinking of doing so? Are you have you not started with Kubernetes at all? Like, where where are people at? in their Kubernetes journey? I am currently myself uh, uh, in progress of installing Kubernetes, but uh, there are people that here that have already set up Kubernetes. All right. Same for us, we are moving from uh, hosting ourselves to going to using Kubernetes as a service in Azure. So mm. we're just yeah. starting our trip uh, that's and that's good. That's, that's one of the the, the uh, 
I, I I wouldn't want to host my own Kubernetes. Let's just like put it like that. It's it's there's so much st stuff to keep track of. Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Right. Uh, so, so I guess we have some sort of like mix of people here that uh, obviously have been the uh, you know you know like mentioned are running Kubernetes, but not probably not in Azure. Uh, I have a lot of things related to like the basic of Kubernetes, but I'm gonna skip most of that um, and rather just uh, let's see what have I? I have a million slides about a lot of things. So I'm guessing everyone's familiar with containers, you know how that came to be. Uh, but but just like a quick like getting everyone on the same page, you know, we used to have computers. Well, these are the small computers that came after a while. So you know, mainframe computers where there was like machines standing in rooms, and then you had operators going around operating these machines, and uh, you know that worked for a while. But obviously, as soon as you kind of got like these uh, the the personal computer and everything became like microcomputers, as they used to call it, even though they were huge, uh, we kind of got to the point where we had. Uh, the possibility of having more machines in the, in a tighter space, right? And at that point, we were we were still doing, you know, what you see on the picture here, going around, or and maybe many of you already are still doing that. But uh, but you know, having that less virtual but more physical. So you had like more physical networking. You had more physical servers. You couldn't split up a server to do if you had if you had a physical box, you and you know following best practices you you didn't want to put a lot of things on that one server you know, one server does one thing but um then came virtual machines and not only virtual machines but also virtual networking and virtual a lot of these things that we think of as cloud native or at least like the start of cloud native um and and all of a sudden you had one big machine that could be split into a lot of servers you know and we're starting to get somewhere but it's not until like well, I don't know. I shouldn't guess, but like like last decade, I said like that that we got to the point where we had containers. Like now, when now we don't think about servers in general, we think about the application. And as soon as you kind of start changing that mindset and thinking of containers instead of servers, there's a lot more you can do. Um, for instance, you if you're a developer, you shouldn't have to think of how like the how your application then interacts with you know the the virtual machines uh, um, you know operating operating system and things like that you 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 know completely past that at this point uh, you can just think about your code and make sure that it works inside of this little confined thing called a container and as long as it runs on your machine it will actually run other places as well so you know it's 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 more of that you got away from it, but it works on my machine why doesn't it work in production we we're, we're closing into actually having more or less the same experience, obviously, with a few caveats. Um, so I have a, a lot of things here. This is like a slide in progress. So this is, uh, and uh, a lot of these things are for a more uh, less experienced audience. So I'm just going to jump past a lot of things. But a brief introduction about Kubernetes um, came out of Google. If you haven't seen it, there's a two part documentary now about Kubernetes out. That, just came out. It's, it's a really great thing to to get through if you you want to learn more about this. But uh, Google was doing a lot of like automation and orchestration in the back end in a system called Borg, which is so nerdy that I just wish they kind of went with that as a thing outside. But but then you had like this spin-off thing. They wanted to make an open source version of that, but then you know to be utilized by others. And uh, they had like a prototype called Seven of uh, you know Seven of Nine, which again is a Star Trek reference. But then they went with uh, then they went with the the Kubernetes, and the, I mean the Kubernetes is actually also kind of nerdy because it's a Greek word that means you know taking the 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 one taking charge, the helmsman or whatever you want to call it, and which is why the nautical team came out and it works with uh, you know Docker containers because Docker had obviously the whale. And you kind of see some of these things continue to uh, to stick with the theme here. But so it's it's container orchestration. But I think of it as more of as an uh, API server. It's it's a it's a um, one single approach to handling a big complex system based on API. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is that every single resource that are in Kubernetes is actually defined through the uh, Kubernetes API which you then can extend. 
and then you can create where, what we call uh, your, you can create your own parts and uh, expand that uh, API and then create what's called an operator, which kind of, if you go back to the mainframe thing, it kind of takes the same position as that. It's the operator, except that you just define a resource. You say, I want this to work. And then the operator actually goes out and does it. It's not you. So you kind of automate a lot of tasks away with it. And that's kind of how a lot of things in Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes or in the cloud native world is built. If you have a tool that will, uh, like if you're having a, a, a backup as a service, uh, as, as a thing that you need, you could install a, a PostgreSQL operator or a, as uh, you know, uh, MongoDB or you know whatever type thing, you, you can find operators that will handle uh, creating new databases and and get, and doing all of those things, and you can just define them as a resource, which is really cool to think of, like how you can kind of expand this uh, native capability of of the platform itself to to bid your to do your bidding. But obviously, it's also you know doing it's containers. So containers is a, a very vital thing, but it also does things like service discovery and can help you with automatic uh, rollouts, rollbacks, and 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 uh, mm -hmm. scale out and scale uh, scale down and and uh, self healing. Um, always like the term bin packing. So you know you're taking your application, you're putting in a, a pack, a, a bin pack, and you say, all right, here's the entire thing. Please run this. Mm -hmm. So it does all these things automatically and just makes it simple for you to to handle. And also has some secret configuration management. Um, like I said, I have a lot of things there, but but I'll I'll uh, quit. I'll do like six words about each of them because you know, or as we know, sit here talking about this forever. But obviously, uh, you know, we have containers. But in in Kubernetes world, you have a, a pod as like your base, uh, you know, unit, uh, which is a group of containers, so one or any number of containers. The most common thing is to have one to one ratio, but it's just like. Um, uh, having that pod as the, uh, the 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 smallest unit makes it so that you can have um, things like sidecar uh, the patterns. For instance, if you're doing a service mesh and you need networking automatically, you can just put another container on the side, and those uh, and the the your application and you know the the proxy application at, at that point, they both share the same network level. So they can talk like if they were on the same computer, but then your application, instead of going out into the world directly, it goes through this proxy. And you can do that for a lot of things, secret injection. So if you're using HashiCorp Vault, for instance, that can be a thing. You can you spin up a sidecar that deals with secrets and can then stash your secrets uh, closer to your application, you know, and, and solve all those things. And also a pod is a flock of whales. Containing all that. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, pods. Uh, you can st stand up pods, but it's much more easier to use something called a deployment, which then you can say this is uh, these are the pods that I want, and this is the template that it should follow, and I want six of them, and that just solves itself. All right, cool. So, so but uh, at that point, it's stateless. It doesn't have to be completely stateless, but but for sake of argument. It's stateless. So what it, what happens is it just creates like a hash name at the end, and it's it's random. Uh, you can say that it should store some of these things if you kill it, but you know the idea is to just you know if if you need if if you don't need it anymore, you can delete the entire thing. Um, on the other side, you have something called a stateful set, which kind of does the opposite. So instead of having like uh, the name and then a random hash, you would have a name and then dash zero and so on and so forth. And you have more control to kind of like make sure to keep these things like uh, you you want this uh, these to scale up and down. But if you need the second one up again, it should have the same uh, information as it used to have. Slow animation. Uh, all of these works with the volumes. And, and uh, if you go back a little bit, Kubernetes is built on the idea of uh, doing something very well. And that's the orchestration part and the API part, and then doing stuff uh, more or less on a basic need. So like secret management, you know, and stuff like that. It, there is it is there, but it's just stored in base 64. And if you have the access, you can you know figure out anything. But um, uh, it's more of a, um, a, a modular system. So 
you can, uh, for instance, for volumes, uh, if you're using Azure, you can, uh, when you order a volume, it will automatically fix a disk for you. It will, uh, if it's a file shared you want, it will automatically fix all those things. So you can just kind of say, this is how the storage that I want to use looks like, and everything else just gets plugged in. And the reason why that works is because uh, Azure and Google and Amazon and everyone who has these services are also involved in the Kubernetes project. So they, they are part of building it in the same fashion for everyone, which makes stuff like this work better. If there are any part of these things that anyone want to ask about, like specifically, just to shout out while I'm doing it, uh, or else I'm just going to go through this and then we can start talking about how to actually run Kubernetes in a, in a more, you know, uh, better fashion than, than just staying it up randomly. Um, you also have something called a job and a cron job. A job is specifically just saying, this is the container that I want, or this is the application I want to run, and I want to run it, and it has a success criteria. If that success is is hit, uh, delete it, stop, stop the pod. So it's more of a actual task or, or job. And obviously then a cron job, which uh, if you have been in IT for more than you know, five minutes, you know that cron means obviously setting something on a schedule. So a cron job is exactly that. You can run a repeating task, you know, whenever you want. And you can you can find like it needs to be completed six times or something like that, but but not like in a deep meaningful way. So you know you're supposed to create something that would either finish in a success or a failure, and based on that, obviously you have to deal with it. Daemon sets, not something you usually handle that much if you are just using Kubernetes, but if you're uh, for instance, creating a software that uses Kubernetes as a base, or you have a need to put a single pod on each of the nodes in a cluster, that's a daemon set. So that just makes it make sure that it's deployed on all nodes. And you know, like I said, logging and stuff like that. If you you had the after monitoring agents and log analytics things, all those are daemon sets that are run on because they need to be able to actually um, interact with the machine at the bottom itself. Services again, um, uh, again, just quickly going through this. That's how you do load best networking in a sense. So, what it does is just a, it's a single point of contact, and based on how you define that point of contact, it can then automatically point people or uh, you know, network traffic in the right direction. Um, this is something that you can use internally, which is what people most most how people are used, usually doing it. But it can also be an external thing. But then at that point, uh, again, since this is like modular, um, at that point in Azure, you get a load balancer spun up, and that kind of just points an IP directly into your service, which is, might not be what you want to do. What you probably want to do instead is having an ingress. Uh, and ingress actually doesn't do anything. What it does is defining how to get into that, uh, you know, that's to that service. And then you would, would have to have an ingress controller, which is an actual application running, which then sets up a service, which then gets an IP. And when everything goes into that IP, it then looks at the, the routing specifics that you have in your ingress uh, resources and say, all right, for this host, you're going to go over to this service. And so on and so forth. And then, you, um, speaking of ingress controllers in Azure, you have an you have the application gateway ingress controller, which you can set up that automatically uh, automatically updates your application gateway uh, based on these resources, which is a really cool thing to have. So, that's a really quick thing. Uh, but you know what we're talking about here is the the Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS. And I, you know, it's a hosted service. And if you, like one of you have uh, have actually hosted Kubernetes yourself, it's not a great, it's not fun, right? Because you have all these concepts that are not even just on the, you know, actually you know, usage level. You have the idea of having worker and master nodes. You need to have ma uh, master nodes, and you need that needs to be redundant in some fashion. And you'd be uh, taking care of the uh, the the backend database of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes, which is called etcd. Uh, that needs to be taken care of in a in a in a good fashion. Uh, if you get a new uh, node in and or new agent uh, uh, worker node in, 
you want to get into the cluster, you need to uh, get certificates because you know that's how they authenticate. It's just a lot of work, and then try upgrading that in a good fashion. All of those things are taken care of by Azure, and what they do is they have um, everything related to the control plane of Kubernetes, the things that are running on the master node. Uh, they are hosting that, so you don't even see that. And upgrading versions in, in Azure is literally going to the menu and say, I want this version from a drop down menu, and it does that for you. Uh, like anything else, like you need to make sure that everything is set up correctly so you don't break something. But still, uh, it's, it's much more easier than hosting yourself. And uh, Kubernetes have our back. So you can create users, you can create groups, and you can create all these roles and, and give people access. But you can, in Azure, you can also integrate it directly into Azure AD. So you can give people access based on that and not and having to go into the cluster and doing things manually there. And also, obviously, monitoring and, and log analytics and uh, also application insight, all, all those things, all these advanced things are already there. Um, um, yes, for, for nodes even, it's not like it's spinning up one machine. It's, 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 uh, you create a node pool, and that node pool is a virtual machine scale set. So you can say, I want one node in my node pool or you know, 100. And you don't have to think about this. That's just get automatically added. So there's a lot of things there that uh, is easier, and also a lot of add-ons. The great thing about add-ons is they are there usually are things that you can install yourself, but instead of you installing it and keeping track of the versions, you can use these add-ons to then just uh, get that installed and also get that updated. And we have a hand raised. Take a chance to drink the water. Go, Nick. I've I've muted the. Uh, sorry, it was an error in the application. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you, did you have a question or did you? No, no, I don't have a question. Okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just... Yeah. All right. Cool. So uh, when, with these add-ons, what what happens is that, the, like I said, you you get everything installed, and it's not anything different than what you would have if you did it yourself. And uh, things that are supporting right now is uh, the the like application gateway ingress controller. You can install that by yourself, or you can just have AKS solve that for you. There are also things like uh, Cert Manager, which if you're using Kubernetes and haven't used Cert Manager, then I I don't know what you're doing. Uh, Cert Manager is great. What it does is uh, lets you set up um, um, a certification, for instance, Less Encrypt. So if you have a hosted service, you use Less Encrypt certifications. You can just define how you want that to look. And every time you create a, a new endpoint that needs to be, you know, have TLS enabled, you'll just, you can just say, this should have uh, a, uh, a, a TLS certification for Less Encrypt. And then it, it, it fixes that. No renewal of certifications, nothing like that. And Cert Manager also supports uh, all other ACME standards and and uh, and things like that. So I set that up with uh, uh, with uh, with like other um, uh, certificate providers, um, and it's it just works. And it's like the thing that people are complaining about the complexities of Kubernetes. Well, if you are still putting stuff on a Linux server, having nginx, and then manually updating your certificates. It's easy on Kubernetes, to be honest. And there's a lot of those things. That's what operators are built for, to make it easier for you. You can just automate away things, and it's done in a in good, simple fashion. And also, AKS also uh, uh, supports SLA and you know support. So if stuff goes wrong, you can actually call someone while hosting it yourself. That doesn't work. Um, I probably don't need to go through this, but you can you can get the config here. And I probably need to do that because the cluster I'm supposed to showing off all of a sudden timed out for some reason. Um, but deploying, you could use uh, kubectl, which is the CLI tool, which obviously works. Uh, you can use the Azure portal, so you can just go in there and do things. And there's a lot of uh, things accessible there, and we'll look at that afterwards, but not everything's there, and sometimes you need a little bit more hands-on. 
Uh, what I prefer is actually CLI tools uh, like uh, K9, um, K9 or K K9s if you want to call it like that. Say it like that. Obviously, a spin of the K8s, which is the abbreviation for Kubernetes, uh, or Lens, which is uh, another tool that's really fantastic. It gives you you know access to everything uh, behind the scenes, but from your machine. Uh, or what, how I prefer to actually operate stuff is uh, GitOps, or you could do CI CD, obviously. So that was like more just typical standard things. You can actually actually DevOps pipelines to deploy uh, your your man Kubernetes manifest, or or even have uh, you know there's even tasks there to deploy directly to Kubernetes, um, or you can set something up through the deployment. Uh, uh, center inside of Kubernetes, uh, I guess, but that's uh, you know, something people usually don't do because we want control, right? Uh, <clears throat> but GitOps is a different uh, beast. Uh, so Flux and Argo are the most popular ones. Um, these uh, are installed on your cluster. And what you do is you point them in the direction of a Git repository. And then that Git repository, uh, as we in the in the Open GitOps uh, uh, you know, project in CNCF say, is your uh, you know, uh, your desired state. Everything you have in your cluster should come from Git, and then that becomes actually the entrance point of, of doing operations. So you you uh, since Git is a versioned uh, you know um, uh, call it like a, a database. Um, every time you do something, it's a new version. Right of that state, and and that makes it easy to do changes. Oh, didn't work. Or, okay, uh, uh, get revert. But let's get back to the version that worked, and you have full control in, in that sense. And there's a lot of cool integrations. So maybe we can show that. All right, uh, way much more slides than I wanted to go through. But anyway, you have Microsoft Learn as stuff there if you are completely new to it. And also if you want to deep dive into Kubernetes things, there's our, there are some Kubernetes exams. All right, cool. Now we've gone through all of that. Uh, some of you uh, said that you are running Kubernetes or are in the process of moving to Azure. Some of you are starting to learn Kubernetes things. Um, uh, hold off, but. Was finding my mouse yeah. uh, to unmute myself. Uh, okay, so I have a question for you. I don't know if mm -hmm. it's too detailed, but it's um, so we are starting our journey to becoming a, a super Kubernetes uh, outfit. Yeah. Uh, and and the history of computers is kind of how we've been evolving. So we had our own, then we had our own virtual uh, yeah. running on our servers, and then we moved over to Advania. Uh, running virtual servers there, and now we're moving to Azure, and yes. we've connected. So through our firewall, wall, our network is connected to Advania, mm -hmm. uh, to their servers, and then now they have connected us to Azure. So it's it's like part of our network. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're wanting to set up our first Kubernetes cluster, and we are on the paranoid side. So we saw that there was something called private cluster, and we yeah. said, okay, that sounds like something we would want to use, uh, but with the minimum fuss, though. So you have to be on the same network, I guess, and to be able to kubectl into it when it's private. Yes. Uh, can can you in baby language describe or how can we do it through our dedicated VPN uh, channel? So yes, so when you set your uh, cluster as a private cluster, uh, what happens at that point is if we if we find the actual moving pieces in in the back of this this example cluster, um, I just have to think how to get there. <laughs> um, I usually go this way or this route. Uh, it's here. All right. Uh, in in the back end here, you have your load balancer, which then becomes like the the uh, the you know entrance point network wise. So that's that's completely taken care of by Kubernetes. And what happens uh, if you set to private it? That doesn't get a public IP. Um, the only difference is that you at that point would have to have 
some sort of network connection to your cluster. Um, other than that, it works exactly the same way. It's still, as long as you haven't uh, gone in and said that you want Atlas in networking. Uh, to if you if you haven't set like auth, uh, authorized IP ranges, um, um, you know, then it will be open to everyone as long as you can get into the network, right, and get routed to the correct sub uh, subnet of the VNet in, in mm -hmm. question. So that's the only difference between a private and not a private uh, network. Um, there are. Uh, there are some uh, a little bit uh, like extra steps that you might want to do at that point. You could define uh, your own. Um, uh, so everything in Kubernetes is very reliant on DNS. Uh, I'm not sure if, if we go back to the. But maybe a, a small in between question. Would okay. you set your cluster up as private? Because now we're starting and this has kind of been a stopping point. We can't get it to work this way. Would you have it as private or would you? Most of my friends are just running public and they said, well, Microsoft doesn't not recommend it, but. Uh. It complicates things yes. uh, in the same way as, and again, a little bit of the same way that you have two different ways of doing networking. You have the Azure, which makes every pod has its own IP, or you can use the KubeNet one, which just have like a, a couple of IP addresses, and then it does a lot of routing on the inside. Uh, using like the Azure one, just getting the IPs makes it obviously easier because at that point, if you're doing things in firewalls or, or routing, you you actually have an IP for the thing that you're trying to reach, uh, and it gets complicated if you have to do a lot of you know routing uh, back and forth between cluster and and so forth. And it's the same for the, like the private cluster. If you put it on, it's more complicated because you need to get that traffic uh, you know to to reach that. Um, in in a in a way, but but at the same time, it's not really. It doesn't take away from like the experience of using it as long as you can, are able to connect to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but if you have hybrid networking setup, there <laughs> there's a lot of things in between your computer and then the AKS cluster. You know, so anywhere along the line there, you might be uh, having some issues, and and there's a long a long. Um, you know, um, long list of things to check. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that it didn't work like straight out of the gate. There probably are something in, in so somewhere that that puts your traffic, you know, makes it go a different route. Um, do you want to have a private cluster or not? That Can really I depends. In? Yeah. Can I pitch it? Yes, feel free. OK, so. If you have uh, your internal network peered with the Azure network, then mm -hmm. I would go with a private cluster because you can communicate with the uh, uh, Kubernetes API on your VPN connection. Yep. Uh, and then to expose the cluster outside, I would set up a ingress controller with a public IP and change the DNS mm -hmm. record to that. And put up a ingress controller that is just you know on the internal network for the internal yeah. services. That's my set. I would prefer. So yeah. so uh, for, for um, the only thing this is going to affect is the uh, uh, how you access um, things inside of the cluster or the, like the API, for instance. It's like how you access that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you have something that needs to be reached, like like an application that are actually going to be hosted, yes, you you will set up an ingress control anyway. That ingress control is going to get a public IP. Like there's no reason to have it there if not. Um, and 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 at that point, you can set up services that people can reach, but you can't reach the API. So that's kind of like the the main difference. Uh, but again, um, it depends on your needs. Uh, most of the time, I don't set up private clusters, and I haven't really in 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 a lot of scenarios because, um, well, I, I work with a lot of people that are, you know we aren't using VPNs to connect to stuff because we're in the cloud. So uh, we we would rather than just set uh, the authorized IP, which is to make sure that no one else can get in, right? So okay. you can you can secure it in other ways than than making it harder to reach, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. It sounds, but the, okay, then a side, okay, spin off question. Yep. Now, because we've been running, so our cloud is kind of, it's behind the Advania firewall, so it's like 
kind of just another one of our data centers. Um, mm. We were thinking about uh, routing traffic out. Same principle that traffic coming from our uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes clusters would go out through Advania and out through our uh, mm our public IP addresses. What are your take on that? Should we just stop going through the Advania firewall or to go directly out from Azure or? So uh, again, uh, if you are, if you have an AKS cluster that has things in it that needs to reach some sort of like central server or reach out to a service that you're running elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, you could set up uh, uh, like this example says uh, to uh, you can set up like where the egress uh, traffic goes and you can uh, route it through fire Azure firewalls or or even you know through the VPN and everything like that so it doesn't go out on online. There are a lot of things that Kubernetes needs that is uh, public. So um, um, not only things in Azure but also just you know to to reach out to to uh, Docker Hub, to to all, everything, all other container instances, and and uh, some of the things that you might be using also might then need to have internet uh, access. Um, again, I, I'm kind of in the middle ground when it comes to security on this level because at some point you kind of uh, you know overcomplicate something that doesn't need to be that complicated. If you're using less encrypt to do certifications, it needs to reach less encrypt servers, for instance. Mm -hmm. You, you just make it hard for yourself, but if you have a need to, um, um, if you have a requirement to to route network traffic into one centralized place, and then have that go through some sort of firewall. Uh, you could you could easily do that, but if that cluster has no uh, attachment to any other services that you are having, you might not need to, and that might they they might not even reach anything beyond their own virtual network, for instance. Uh, so it has that and the internet, so it doesn't go anywhere if that cluster gets, you know, uh, taken by some sort of uh, hacker, you know, they can't escalate beyond that point. So uh, it kind of depends, uh, just like with everything else in, in life. Um, the, again, the more security, the more complicated it gets, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a, you pull one string, then it goes up on the other end. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I've had a lot of issues trying to get, for instance, Azure Firewall with network trafficking from Kubernetes to work and, and things like that. And I, the, it, it gets hard for, for all of us uh, at that point, you know. Yeah, but we, one, one of our requirements is that uh, some of the services that talk to us, they expect us to come from a specific IP, so our external. Oh, but at that point, you have an external IP. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Uh, because you know, uh, again, the the outgoing traffic is is through that same. It, it gets some public IP for that. So so you have a standard IP for everything. That all the traffic goes out. Yes. Yeah. So that that shouldn't be a big issue. And also, you can, if you look at this specific, you can you can define. For instance, like a NAT gateway or something like that, but also you can define uh, specifically your IP address so you have like the same IP address always. So you, even if the cluster needs to be redeployed, you can go back to the same IP and, and no one else has to change. It's just you that's doing, they're doing all this. All right. Hope that answered. Yep, talk. Questions. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? So if not, I'll um, I'm just going to show off some of the the uh, Azure capabilities that are built in. So um, as we can see here, we have this Kubernetes resource uh, pane on the side here, and and we we kind of come back to some of these terms that we already been talking about. Uh, if you go into the namespaces one, you'll like it says, it just list all your namespaces um, and you can add things here. So what it actually does is just contacting the API itself and then shows this off in a, in a more, um, you know, uh, you know, portal like fashion. Um, and uh, every single thing here works as you would expect. You can go in and check, you know, OK, this was a bad example. It doesn't have anything on it. Let's just say the gatekeeper. 
yeah. So you know, if it has labels, you can see that uh, an annotation, you can see that as well. And also you can go in and just see the YAML version of that particular resource. So in this case, this namespace. And, and stuff like just seeing all the events happening here. Uh, not that there isn't anything happening at the moment, but but uh, but if there was, you would see that there. Um, and that's kind of how it works across the board. You go into the workloads one and you can see your deployments. You can see your stateful sets. And th this one is kind of just uh, a holdback. Uh, replica sets is something that you usually do because deployments are kind of on top of that again. Uh, so deployments are creating these replica sets that then creates all the plots, just you know, just to abstract it even more. But if you see here, for instance, we have uh, some things in Cube system, which is you know the, where everything's running, and we can see all these things here. So um, um, if you look at the Cordian S1 it's in Cube system, uh, we can relatively easily see uh, go down the line. If we go in there, we'll see the pods. That that deployment is, so you can see everything like this in in a, in a reasonable fashion, um, and and everything like this works as expected. I just find it more not difficult, but but I'm most, much more used to actually being a little bit more hands on. Um, so I would what I would have to do because uh, I tried to do it and it didn't work. Right, let's open a new terminal and ignore the fact that I have an old version of PowerShell. This computer has been have been on for a long time. Uh, excuses. It's good to have. Um, I'm just gonna sh check if we are in the right. So what I noticed is that we didn't get in. Oh no, we do. Never mind. All right. So uh, again, some of this is for the for the way newer people to this than than the others. But but if if you press connect here, you know, as you can see anything because I have this thing that. It marks everything as, as like a blur. Uh, what it does is just giving you an easy way to get the. Um, uh, you have to obviously log into Azure CLI, or you can actually do this also through PowerShell, but they don't display that because why would they? I don't know why they they aren't backing up PowerShell as much these days, but whatever. But it's just basically just setting to the right subscription, uh, this one, and then the second one is uh, an ASET get a. Uh, ASAT AKS get credentials for that particular cluster, so you don't have to type that out. Um, so this is K9S. Uh, if you haven't used it, uh, it's pretty great. So it is a CLI tool. It's built on Go, so you can put it on anywhere. And uh, you have like these Vim-like features. So if you have a, a colon, you get the the command there, and you can write, for instance, uh, PO, which is the short for pod or pod, and and then you can see. Uh, you can even sort by namespace. If we just look at Argo CD, this is what we get. If we're looking at the my Terraform Cloud thing here, we'll see the one that I have there. And and again, it's, it's naturally go in. You can see all the containers. It makes sense. Uh, but you also have port forwarding and stuff like that here, so you don't have to type out all those things. That's uh, one thing that I like. So if I do port forwarding, this is a bad example. Um, Argo is so one. One uh, shift. F and then I just get everything that I need. It it um, it knows that it's going to go for a certain container and the port there, and it sets up everything. And I'll just go through this and go yes, and now I can connect. Um, so this is a nice tool to be using. Um, like I said, um, I I'm, 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 uh, I work uh, both in the working group and on the projects that has the name GitOps in it, and and um, and that's the that's the way that I would control basically all application deployments that we have in in um, in, um, in Kubernetes. Uh, let me just I'm trying to think of a nice way of showing this. Um, so, for instance, in Azure itself, you actually have this now GitOps. Uh, pre, uh, well, it's a preview one, but it's it's a it's a GitOps capability. I and mean, what it does is in the backend, it installs Flux CD. And everything you need there, and but you can define your uh, setup through the portal. Uh, so we can do that to a certain point at least. Um, again, you can define stuff like uh, what namespace you want it in, but also if the flux itself should just be for one namespace or an entire cluster. What you can do then is like you can get, set up a certain configuration per team, for instance. So a, a team should have its own flux because they need to. Have their own separate life cycles, uh, you know, so they don't bump into each other while trying to do all these things. 
um, but uh, and give them and, and they only have access to that namespace, for instance. Uh, a dog just came, so sorry about that. Um, but but uh, but then you know they have their own uh, Git repository. You set up your own Flux instance, your own configuration for that, in a namespace which they have access to. So if you have like multiple teams working in the same cluster but shouldn't be able to access each other's stuff, you can do it like that, or just have one deployment that does all. And everything you do here is just uh, let's just call this something. And what you do is just set it up against a uh, Git repository. You know, if you want it in a different branch, I don't know why you want to do that. That's not best practice, by the way. Uh, best practice in GitOps is basically having one branch and uh, do pull requests directly into that, or even just committing straight to the code if if it's a you know separate team because uh, you have other ways of uh, dealing with uh, with things breaking. Um, and if you have a private one, you could define your SSH keys so you can get in there. So you you, know, you, could, you don't have to have stuff publicly. Um, and that's about it. Uh, for my use case at the moment, because I'm experimenting with things, not only doing Flux, I have this uh, Argo CD server up and running. Uh, and again, I'm trying to think of a good way of doing this without showing off things that aren't supposed to be shown. So let me do let me let me do another terminal window and just kind of throw it over here. Sorry, because I need to get a. Uh, a password. I don't want to show that weird, weirdly enough. Not that it's not going to give you anything, but just to make it easy for myself to not screw up. Well, don't save this. I know probably something else I don't accidentally paste. Um, so for instance, this this and, and this is like why we want to do Kubernetes because you can mix and match. So every single open source project that is available is uh, obviously also available for AKS, even though it's behind like Azure. So Microsoft is just dealing with the cluster itself. Then you have all the possibilities to do whatever you want, right? As, you know, so it, it makes perfect sense to to uh, um, to use a hosted service because you don't have to deal with the bad stuff. But then again, you have every Thing else you want to do, uh, all of it. Sorry for being the. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> was was would you do Arco or Flux? That's maybe this. Uh, we have set up Arco and it works okay, but I I've never seen Flux, so now that you're talking about it. Mm, so uh, from a uh, if you want to be very pragmatic, it's not doing a lot different. Uh, the main a difference between Argo and Flux is the fact that Argo, first of all, came a little bit later. So it's it, it, things like that. There wasn't a real nice like user interface, for instance. You know, was one of the first things that that, that came out with Argo. Um, but uh, but Flux, which uh, and and both of these are CNCF projects, so they're both you know open source. Uh, not uh, controlled by any organization. You know, it, it works by the CNCF uh, rules and, and the standards there. Um, but um, the main difference is that for most of the Argo things, and the way that I see it, at least for most of the Argo things you have, uh, first of all, you do a lot more through this interface, but everything is more in a um, uh, application-based uh, setup. So you, you have these... Um, you're dealing with uh, uh, you setting up things uh, for each application. If that makes sense. So okay. I have this application, so I set this up. I have this other application, so I set that up. Uh, while Flux is more of a bootstrap your entire cluster, and that's how more people are using it. It's like bootstrap the entire cluster. You can also do this, but it's more natural to just bootstrap the entire cluster and point that towards the Git repository. And then you define everything there. And and you don't have to do all these things, um, so that's like the main difference that I see that people are at least using these tools for. But there's also dashboards for Flux, for instance. So, or now at least. So, the differences are very small. But okay. Flux is the Flux is the 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 forerunner. Is is the one that actually uh, Flux is created by WeWorks, and WeWorks are the one that made the word GitOps, like literally. So. You know, it is the or, uh, origin, so to speak, and um, it makes more sense, at least in a let's call it like a like a, a system versus a uh, you know towards end users 
type of thing because it runs in the background. Okay. Uh, and that's why, for instance, in AKS, they use Flux because that just makes more sense. You, you do everything through this portal. In the background, everything just happens uh, based on the resources. Um, do you know if I'm using Terraform to uh, set up my cluster? Do you know if I can hook it in there automatically as one of the options? Or uh, so the, the, the GitOps add-on for AKS uh, yeah. is still very much in preview. And okay. for uh, Terraform, that add-on hasn't come into the to the provider yet. Okay. okay. Uh, but uh, if we go into this one and we write uh, Flux CD, for instance, you have actually a a, a Flux uh, provider, which you could cool. use to bootstrap your cluster. Cool. So yeah. you know you you can do it that way uh, for now. But uh, obviously, at some point, the add-on is going to be there, and you can just say yes, get ops. Cool, I want cool, that. Cool. Okay, that well, that's also a good option, a uh, good reason to use it uh, because it will simplify the setup. Well, the fin final poison question uh, is: Do should we commit trying to learn it? I've been warned that it is uh, complicated. Um, if you are able to find the need for something like Istio, then uh, sure. But if you start looking at it, you're probably going to end up finding all of the things that make Istio like the combined thing of Istio and make that work. You probably find at least most of it in maybe one or maybe even you know have to go to two different products and they would do it better. That's, do it that's better how I'm simpler. OK, OK, that's, so that's how I look at it at least. OK. So for isolation and service mesh and all that stuff, I could do it in a simpler way, possibly. Yeah, at, uh, if you want a service mesh and, and, and those kind of features, I, I would go for something like Linkerd or uh, Open Service Mesh. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't go to the, uh, actually, I, I would probably only go to Linkerd, to be honest. Um, and that's just simple because it's it's smaller, it's faster, it's it's much more optimized for, for those things. And it, it uh, Again, it, it it basically the people behind Linkerd are the ones that made the word service mesh. So you know you kind of go back to that again. Like they they are they they were really you know, forward thinking in a lot of these things, and they simply have the the, the most lean and and best solution out there. Um, but you might need to combine it with something else if you want a very specific thing. Okay, super duper. Thank you. No problem. That's what I like about doing Kubernetes stuff because you kind of get on a uh, can jump into more or less anything in the world. Um, other things to think of uh, before we end that I kind of like my my my, my tips and tricks. You know what I'm going to call it. Um, stuff like node pools. So um, I don't have it in, in this one, but I usually would uh, I would usually have a node pool for uh, system uh, things. The reason for that is uh, the cluster itself will work since the control plane is, you know, you know, uh, uh, somewhere else. But there are some things that are run like a da daemon set for the cluster itself. That um, if you um, uh, if you don't manage your resources well and end up uh, overrunning a cluster in in some form or fashion, uh, I would rather have some of these things have their own, you know, own place to be. So, you know, for, for very like like log, log things and, and Azure related things and, and even stuff like Linkerd and, and those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to have like, uh, you don't have to do it like that. I just prefer to do it that way. Uh, one thing to think of when it comes to node pools is uh, the node sizes that you are running. Uh, again, this is just a demo thing that I'm having up and running, so I don't really care that much about it. But in production, um, I see a lot of like the like D4 type um, uh, machines used. Um, there is a site called, I'm just pulling out of the other site, uh, learnkas.io, which have a resource called Instance Calculator. And this one is really great because then you can see what I, it's much easier to, to see what I mean there. But if I take off the other cloud vendors, and let's say that I have a pod 
that I know that I'm, I'm setting up the request for uh, half a CPU, so 500-ish, and at least a gig of RAM out of the gate. Um, and I set the pod limit, like the max amount that it can use to be, let's say four. I don't know. I don't know what I'm running that, that needs this. And and it's not that CPU. You obviously will just do one. And we have some daemon sets that are, are taking some space up. Not a lot, but a little bit. And what you can see here is what you get is a, a graph here that kind of shows you uh, all these machines. And you can see how efficient it is to run the pods that you want. Um, uh, for instance, we have this A2 version 2. It's a 2 gig uh, uh, memory and uh, two CPUs, and it's 76.49% efficient. You can see we, we, we are able to squeeze in two pods on this server. And that means that the pod will then cost $32 because you know that's the price of the VM. So we can kind of look at that, like for instance, like this one. Obviously, this is a beast of a machine. <laughs> and you know, but people won't probably be using this. But if you wanted to go like real down to like cost per pod level, we, we can have this 456 gig and 120 CPU machine and have room for 221. Obviously, this is that's just stupid at that point. But uh, um, we can go for efficiency. I don't know why these blank out. Oh, because they can't have anyone. Uh, this is the way that I want to go. So we can find something that's reasonable for what we want and kind of look at how what we're getting out of it. So. Let's uh, look at the, uh, like this one, it's, uh, so it's a good hefty machine. And uh, at th this point, we can get 26 pods in um, and stuff like that. Uh, and sorry about the dog, I need to lift her because she's, you know, in, in heat, a, bi a bitch in heat, so she whines a lot, sorry. It's okay. Um, so uh, before like like determining like this is the machines that we want, I, I would, Think a little bit about it. The um, th there are some sweet spots, and and you know you probably can't go wrong with something like a, a D4 or D8. I, I would probably have D8 in production just to have a little more room. And again, it depends on what you're actually hosting on it, right? So if you uh, you have to have applications where you have six parts that need to be on the same node because of reasons, network reasons, uh, you know, uh, latency issues or something like that, you need to have at least a set of six uh, pods on, on a machine. You would then go and, and kind of plot that in and figure out that through this. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice little tool. Other than that, um, just quickly at the end there, um, in production, I probably would have had two node pools to do some of these things because uh, when you start upgrading, uh, it's it's so much easier if you have like a, a backup uh, uh, node pool, so you can you can upgrade one node pool at a time, and if that goes to crap, you at least have the other one up. And and uh, again, there's like a uh, there's a middle road here, so there's a lot of things you can do to make sure you can have. Uh, I'm thinking about having like for this one, having a cluster per availability zone, but you know that's uh, at that point you can start getting to the hardcore stuff. Just just having it in in all three availability zones probably it works for 99% of the time. So it's a little bit special, but uh, my uh, my point is just that there's a lot of these things that you kind of have to think about. And like you know, again, the more secure, the the less convenient it is. So you need to find a middle road there. Um, if anyone needs to discuss that, to feel free to reach out to me, and I'll try to point to the right documentations and stuff like that for, for all of these things and hopefully that works. All right, we're coming in on the hour. So if there isn't anything else, then then cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this uh, we are out of time now. Mm -hmm. Um, this has been really, really great. Uh, a lot of uh, questions answered and very interesting. Uh, at least uh, the web page there is uh, something interesting that I've uh, uh, been, been uh, trying to fi figure out myself uh, for how many parts each server could. So it's uh, yeah. really, really interesting to, to get that. I, I made a I made a PowerShell script to to kind of like 
like uh, see it, for instance, like in, in the namespace, which should be an application, like uh, how you know the resources needed, you know, how many machines does that need? So you can uh, kind of help uh, guide in the right direction. So uh, there's a lot of things there to think about, uh, but that's that's like the fine tuning part. Uh, mm -hmm. Just get started with Kubernetes is probably the easiest uh, starting point. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, uh, thank you for this. Uh, it's been really nice to have you, and uh, Thanks, uh, we love you having having you. And uh, yeah, thank you. All right. Hopefully, we'll so. come back. Absolutely, will. Okay. No problem. Bye bye. Bye bye, all. Thanks.